Good morning. Good morning. So, um, men's Bible study Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. Ladies' Bible study Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. That's about it for announcements up there. Um, what I'd like to ask is all of you brothers who are also fathers, if you would stand. Uh, <laughs> I just want to start our service by thanking the Lord for his grace and his design and for you as, as dads, for us as dads. So let me pray. Father God, I do thank you. Uh, on this Father's Day, I thank you, Lord, for my dad. Thank you for the godly example uh, that he has been over the years and his uh, continued example of a man who loves you. Lord, not everybody has that. Not everybody has had that. So, Father, for my, my brothers in this building, who are fathers, Lord, I pray that you would call us to be men of example to our children. God, that we recognize the truth of the gospel, that we are redeemed sinners, but we also recognize the call on our lives, Lord, to be men of your word, to be men of the gospel, Father, to be men who love our families and serve them by serving you. So, Lord, thank you, and I pray for a blessing on these dads today. And I ask for your blessing, Lord God, on our time of worship this morning, that it would be pleasing to you as you see uh, what is in our hearts, Father God, that truly you would be honored in, in, amongst your people, Lord God, and that we would be truly touched, God, in our heart from the truth of your word. And as we walk away from this place, Lord, we would know Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. So I want to see him rightly honored in my life and in the lives of the body here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, now why don't you all stand. Join with us in singing, Bless the Lord. For 10,000 reasons. <laughs> Oh, 
Isolation, loneliness, um, loss of control. You're not able to do the stuff you were doing before. Suspicion of other people. He's not wearing a mask. Um, there's, you know, my mom is being really careful. She's 92. She's at home and she's being careful. We're being careful not to get her exposed. And But she's getting lonely because she's not getting to see friends. Besides the coronavirus, the civil, the um, cure being worse than the disease, and us having to put up with a lot of that, there's civil unrest going on right now that is like trouble, to say the least. You know, there's violent protests, racial uh, tensions, and it's spreading. It just keeps going and going. Uh, looting. And along with this is loss of respect for governmental authority laws, other people's opinions. I mean, nobody's listening to anyone else now. And we've got these calls for defunding the police, of all things. You know, it's just, it seems like we've lost our minds here, collectively. I haven't. And on top of this, sometimes there's a disunity, even among believers, of our neighbors, families, where we're responding differently to this disease and their request for behavior. And one of my biggest fears is just disunity that can come about within the church. So what do we do? We turn to scripture. You know, is God there or not? Is God sovereign? Mm -hmm. Sovereign means king with no, no limits. Turn to Psalm 27. I love this song. Um, Psalm 27, starting with verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? I'm going to read that one again. Listen carefully. The Lord is the light, is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers come upon, came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war rise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. Listen to this. One thing I have asked from the Lord, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, all the days of my life to behold 
behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. And now my head will be lifted above my enemies around me. I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. And let's, let's skip down to verse 13. We're finished. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. The land of the living is here and now. It says, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take. let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Wait doesn't mean sitting back in a rocker. Wait means eager anticipating. You're sitting on the curb. Just wait for him to come and, and do his work. Um, God's on his throne. He is sovereign. Um, and I heard a quote that just stuck with me. It says, we're to, we're to live as though you really believe what you say you believe. Um, we're to live as though you really believe what you say you believe. And sometimes it's really easy to say, well, I believe God's in control. Live as though you believe. And let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your house, your word. I thank you for being able to meet here with your people. And I just thank you for the joy of other believers and the encouragement they are to me. I pray, Lord, that as we move on in, in this time of worship, that we will worship you in song, we will worship you in hearing your word and, and just breathing it in. Lord, I pray that you'll just talk to Dan. Don't let Dan get in the way. Just have him speak your word today. We ask all of these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Stand and join in with us in singing above all. <clears throat> Thank you. 
a prayer than it is just a song. So if you pay attention to the lyrics, you may or may not be able to sing. It chokes me up every time. Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. Does everyone know why we're in Genesis 5 today? Because we did four last year. You're so good. <laughs> if anybody's visiting, you're like, what a weird Father's Day text. But here we are. I thought, you know what would be so moving for a Father's Day passage? A genie almost. Mm. So heartwarming. So, okay. It will be. You may be surprised. I, I have been, just to be totally forthright with you, in my study this week, how moving this chapter really is. So, I want to read it for you, and every pronunciation I do is the correct pronunciation. <laughs> this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man, when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness, after his image, and named him Seth. 
The days of Adam, after he fathered Seth, were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. Enosh lived after he fathered Kenan 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he fathered Mahalalel. Kenan lived after he fathered Mahalalel 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. When Mahalalel had lived 65 years, he fathered Jared. Mahalalel lived after he fathered Jared 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he died. When Jared had lived 62 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch, Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered his son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, thus all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Let's pray. <laughs> Our Father, thank you for this morning. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for PCBC. I <clears throat> praise you, Lord, for the open Bibles. And I pray open hearts are connected to that open Bible this morning, Lord God, that your precious Holy Spirit would instruct us. A text that we may not fully come with high expectations to be moved by, Father, I pray your word would not return void, but you would powerfully use this in the lives of these Christians. That, God, there would be a change in our lives. We would be greater, deeper followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's for his name's sake I pray. Amen. Don't answer this question. <clears throat> what would you consider... The least important portion of your Bible. Don't answer that question. Just ponder that. What's the least important portion of your Bible? It's a trick question and a dumb one. But I'm using it to kind of jump off into this. If you read your Bible this year, and I know some folks who do this, you read your Bible from leather to leather each year, or cardboard to cardboard if you're one of those. Or if you're reading the... Gizmo, what's that called? iPhone? Um, I don't know about that either. But as, you, as you're reading your Bible through the whole year, far too often, genealogies are skipped. Just outright skipped. Um, turn with me, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. We'll be right back in Genesis. And for this group, I don't think I have to necessarily remind you of this, but it might be good for us. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. What's the first word in verse 16? Oh. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Now, 
I think there's a great mistake when we start to neglect the portions of the Bible that may not instantly touch our hearts or give us a warm fuzzy really quick. There are folks who I think have skipped the genealogies. I, I know a fr- I have a friend who one time told me he didn't read the book of Revelation. When God wanted him to know it, he would tell him how it goes. <laughs> And uh, I sympathize with that um, because it's a difficult book. But there's no portion of the Word of God that is void, that is mute, that is pushed to the side. But I've been a Christian not my whole life, but almost my whole life. I've been in church my whole life. And almost every single time we talk, whether I've seen it, it's happened in this church, it's happened in every church I've been a part of, whenever we talk about difficulties in understanding the Bible, almost every single time somebody says all the names that are hard to pronounce. And our brains, we all say, oh yes, yes, we understand that. And, we, and we, we kind of sympathize with that concept that, yeah, those genealogies are tough, they're difficult. But I think that we lose something pretty important in the neglecting of a portion of God's word, any portion of God's word. Here's a few things. There's great importance in the reading of the whole Bible, reading the Bible in its entirety. I won't do it here, but I want you to ask yourself, have you read the Bible in its entirety? And then if, you, if your answer, and this isn't for guilt, this is, for, this is out of love and prodding, if your answer is, I've never read the Bible in its totality, then I would ask you, what on earth is of greater importance in your lifespan? in your lifespan, that would keep you from reading the Bible fully. I heard a great story of a young man that came to a a pastor and wanted to marry the pastor's daughter, and he said, I really want your daughter's hand, I'd love to marry her. And the pastor, I've never heard anybody do this before, but his response was, okay, but there's one thing, have you read the whole Bible? And he said, "Uh, I've read lots of it, oh great, have you read the whole Bible? No, I have not read the whole Bible. And and his response, he's not just being a jerk. He said, how do I expect you to wisely lead my wife, or lead my daughter as your wife and your children as a father? How could I give her to you when you haven't even taken the time to read all of God's word? So no, you cannot have my daughter until you read the whole Bible. He read it so fast. (laughs) And... uh, and then married her, and I think he's an associate pastor in that church. So <clears throat> these things these things have a way that God, God has them turn out. But I thought, what an interesting thought that seems so no-duh, and yet, beloved, how often may we forget this concept of having the Bible in its entirety read? For the importance, not just to say, I read it, where's my pin, but to say, I think I have a better grasp on the Bible as a whole. And so, unfortunately, too many folks end up just skipping that part. Here's the tricky part, and I, I think there's a, it, it's, it becomes contagious where you find parts of the Bible that are maybe more difficult or harder to grasp, so you neglect it. Well, what you can do, unfortunately, is you develop a bad habit. Because then you come across another portion of the Word, and you say, ah, that one's kind of hard too. Ah, I'll skip that too. And all of a sudden, you're down, you're funneling down to the portions that are your favorite portions, and you say, well, I love to read these portions. Well, that's wonderful, and praise God for his word. But how much of the word is neglected? How much of the word is being left and and pushed to the wayside? And how terrible of a habit? This is why I personally believe pretty strongly in preaching through books of the Bible. Otherwise, I feel there would be a temptation in my heart to go after the text that I am either familiar with or seem to be more appealing preaching-wise. But when I preach through a book, I have no choice, because you will hold me accountable. You do hold me accountable. If I skip the chapter, you go, what are you doing? You skip this part. That's why we're in a genealogy this morning, by the way. (laughs) Every piece of Scripture plays an important role in understanding the rest of Scripture. Every piece of Scripture plays an important role in understanding the rest of Scripture. It's like a puzzle where if if I take away five very, very pivotal, important pieces of that puzzle that you won't see the picture without it, and I say, now put the puzzle together, you go, man, if I only had those five pieces, we would 
we would have such a, a much better flyover view, a box top view of this puzzle if I could just get the five pieces. But the five pieces are trickier, biblically speaking, and so we neglect them. And what it does is it leaves holes in our understanding of the Word of God. And so this concept of the importance of reading the Bible in its totality, even though at times it may be tricky. Um, I always find it fun when somebody visits and we happen to be in a very weird passage of Scripture. Um, not because I selected that, but we're just moving through a book. And, and I'll confess to you, there are times where we may have a visitor, and there's a portion that we are in as a family. And we've covered the whole book, right? But somebody visits, and I'm going, man, I know some of the stuff going on in this individual's life. I know the struggles that are going on. And this is the weirdest text of Scripture. But if I drop it, I, I've neglected my duty as far as preaching through, through the whole book, and I have no reason to not preach that text, and I go through and preach that text. And not every time, but I see it often, where a person who visits is moved by that text. And I, I, I was trying to almost protect them from God's word. What, a, what stupidity that I would think I'd be wiser than God in what portion of his word is what needs to be heard by those people. And so the Bible in its totality, in our reading, but also from the pulpit, I think is vital to hear all of it. All that to say, Genesis 5. I am not going to um, walk through this too slowly. I'm going to preach this whole chapter this morning. But there's a few spots that I'm going to stop on and kind of draw your attention to uh, to get the main picture. Um, this is in contrast to the genealogy of, of uh, Cain. So we saw Cain's descendants, and now we're seeing the descendants of Seth. This starts with Adam and tells us about God's creation of Adam. Once again, all through your Bible, you never get a hint of any other truth, any other reality, except for God created Adam out of nothing. You see that was Jesus' perspective, you see that is Moses' perspective, and all the other authors throughout the scripture, they say the exact same thing, Adam was made by God, and Eve was made by God. Well, and this account starts here once again. In the book of the generations, so there's the book, this, there's a written record of these generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man. Now, we know Adam and Eve become their names, and this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, um, when they were created. So this concept of man and woman, God's creation, God showing himself, making himself known to them, but also them being image bearers of Almighty God. Now, guys, I talked about this last week, and I'll just touch on it for just a sec. It, it's very slippery when somebody <coughs> takes that word image and they, they just track with the physical. And they say, well, they're the image of God physically. Well, we're told God is spirit, so that's not the case. So then what is the case? How are they bearing the image of God? Well, in the text, back in Genesis chapter 2, it specifically speaks to the point of their authority over creation. I think their intelligence level. I think their creation to rule, they're cre or they are created to rule, they are created to reign. God is sharing that with them. Never to the point where they are autonomous. He didn't create a God and then step back and let them be gods. He created them to be worshipers of God, image bearers of God over his creation. And Adam came from Almighty God. Now, it's interesting that it's told he's created in the likeness of God, but if you notice in the text, it says male and female, verse 2, he created them and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. Now, the reason this is interesting is that we see Adam made in the image of God and now Seth made in the image of Adam, meaning this image bearing is continual. Adam didn't lose his image, the image of God that he was created as. Well, Seth is also made in the image of God. 
and let me just connect dots for you, which you already did, I'm sure. You are created in the image, in the image of God. Every aborted infant is created in the image of God. But there's a difference between Adam and Seth. That difference being sin. Because Adam was created without sin, sinned, and now throughout all generations, all human beings are born dead in Adam. Sinners in Adam. So folks don't like that doctrine, um, but God doesn't care because it's true and that's real. That's what's happened. All people are born dead in sin and trespasses. All have fallen short of the glory of God. All are blinded. All are deaf. All are blind to the things of God. They are backbiters, haters of God. The poison of asps is under their tongue. The New Testament is just blistering to the, to the ego of man. Seth is no different. As I, the case that I sought to make last week, when people say the world's getting a lot worse, isn't it? Well, um, I don't know. The, the first sons of the fallen uh, first husband and wife, one killed the other. So apparently sin is rampant right off the bat. We like to think that we're escalating things, but if you look at the history of man, it's been pretty doggone awful for a long, long time. I would argue, back to Cain. And so, the creation of Adam and the creation of Eve, God made them, they sinned, and now they have had other children. The end of chapter 4 was a discussion on the descendants of Cain which will be done in the flood, soon coming. But now we turn to this guy, Seth. Now remember the promise of Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Who is the seed of the woman? Is it Cain? No. Is it, is it Abel? No. He's, he, didn't, he didn't do it. Is it going to be Seth? No, it's not going to be. Now, we'll, we'll cut to the quick. We all know the answer is Jesus Christ. He's the seed of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent. But through, through God's sovereign plan, he's going to be running this, this thread throughout history, going to the line of Jesus Christ. Okay? And hopefully you're familiar with this. If not, just do your best to track with me. But this concept of walking through your whole Bible, you'll be following this thread of the line of Eve. Remember, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Soon we'll see a specific promise made to Abraham where the seed of Abraham will bless every family, every nation. And you start to follow this thread moving through the scriptures. Well, this is where genealogy comes, so in, hand, uh, comes, it comes in so handy that we are moving towards the promise of God being fulfilled. And so here's Seth. And you ask, so will he come through the line of Cain? No, they're going to all be wiped out in the flood. But did you notice who this genealogy ends with? Noah. Name means rest. And Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So basically, guys, what we're doing is this chapter is a great connector in our understanding of the Bible. Okay, We're going from creation to the flood. And this just gives us a nice layout of what's taking place when we pick up in chapter 6 we're going to be told once again man's really bad and God's going to send a great flood but God will continually carry his promise through the seed of Seth which is eventually going to be through the seed of Abraham, uh, Noah down to Abraham so but if you notice just the next portion after we see the creation of man we see Seth to Jared verses 6 to 20 I'm not going to read through those because it basically says the exact same thing in reference to these folks. Not much information is given at all except for this is how old they were when they had a child, then they had other sons and daughters, and then this is how long they lived, and then they died. That's kind of the, the, the layout of the whole genealogy. Now, I find it interesting. You think about some kid, and he goes, well, my name's in the Bible. Really? Your name's in the Bible? Where? Well, I'm one of the other sons and daughters. <laughs> that is interesting. <clears throat> that as you, as you walk through here, you go, well, okay, that's, that's neat. How many? Doesn't say. It's very vague. 
We're just given the oldest son, which is how that line works through the birthright order. That, that's the layout of how this worked at this time. But it, it does inform us that there's still other sons and daughters. Why is that important? Because there, there was a command on man from the very beginning. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That didn't go away. That, that wasn't stopped because sin came. They're still walking in obedience to that command of Almighty God. Adam and Eve did it. Cain did it. Seth is doing it. And we see that there's still an obedience walking to the Lord in that. So, um, verses 6 to 20 gives a layout from son to, to father, father to son, father to son, father to son. And if what I want you to pick up, guys, is that each and every time there's a phrase that has jumped off the text, in my study. And I don't know why in particular, but this just really grabbed my heart in studying this. And he died. And he died. Even as I read it this morning to you, it kept hitting me harder and harder. And he died. And he died. And he died. One commentator like a lightning bolt to my heart, said the day is coming soon where this earth will not remember you. How stressed you've been this week? How stressed were you last week? You losing sleep? You struggling? Frustrated? Discouraged? Hurt? Bitter? Soon. Everyone in this room will be in heaven or hell. We don't give it half the time it needs in our contemplation on a day-to-day -day basis. Soon, everyone in this room will be in heaven or hell. The genealogy has a way of stirring up in the mind, wow, this is so stinking short. And they died, and they died, and they died, and they died, and they died. And here's the thing. Maybe God in his grace would allow Dan 80 years. Maybe. These are living, look at the, look at the time span and how long these people lived prior to the flood. And some folks want to monkey with that and play with it. I, I, I take it literally. I believe that's what he's saying. Before the flood, this is how long people lived. I have no problem with that. Uh, there's a lot of study and a lot of things behind it. I'm not going to go into this morning. If you want to, um, I will purchase the coffee for you to study all night. You bet. But I believe what the text is simply saying is they lived this long. 962 years. Imagine if I told you you got 962 years of uh, you kind of want that. I, I don't know. Um, looking at this world presently, but 962 years. What happened after that? He died. <laughs> 80 years. What happened after he died? See, this is the interesting part, is you watch this world scripting and saving and everything in life is so I can be a little bit longer on this earth, a little bit longer on this earth, and, and you're just running away from the inevitable. It's going to happen. Apart from the Lord's return, or in uh, Enoch's case, uh, the rare case of the Lord taking you, you will taste death. The day will come where you are on a bed and your family is surrounding you and you will feel life leaving your body and you will say goodbye to this world. No more taxes. No more political shams. No more physical pain, emotional pain. Over. You will die. And this earth will say, what a great person. Lord willing, that's what they'll say. We'll get together. We'll say nice things about you. We will rejoice in you, in you as a brother and a sister. And then we'll have potato salad, clean up, and vacuum and go home. I'm not trying to make little of it, but I want you to hear, this is what happens. We die and the earth keeps going. And you can look at these people with all these years. If you add up all those lifespans together, that's a tremendous amount of time. But in light of eternity, it's nothing. And I think in this text, 
we have a precious, sweet reminder that rushes and hits us upside the head in Enoch. Because up to this point, this is just earth, right? They lived, they had kids, they had other kids, and then they died. They lived, they had kids, they had other kids, and then they died. They lived, they had kids, they had other kids, and then they died. And then there's Enoch. And it says, Enoch walked with God. And God took him away. Now, this is so funny because my imagination runs wild with it, but there's so little scripture about this guy. I was talking to my dad, and I told him I was going to be talking about Enoch, and he said, well, great, what are you going to say about Enoch? doesn't say much about Enoch. And he's right, but what is given is quite fascinating. If you turn to Hebrews chapter 5, Hebrews, or I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 11. Now, I'm going to read verse 1 and then 5 and 6, okay? Because it's all tied together. Up to this point, we've been told about these lives and how they ended in death. And then we come to a screeching halt with this guy who didn't die. But, as the scripture says, was taken. Was taken. So verse 1 of Hebrews 11 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So assurance and conviction. You can't see it, but you live based on it. Your whole life is surrounding the invisible, that which you believe. Now drop down to verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. So what do we know about Enoch? We know that Enoch pleased God. We know that Enoch walked in faith. But it's fascinating, guys, because verse 6 then tells us what walking in faith looks like. It says, and without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And as I look at this genealogy, what rushes off the page is what will you be remembered as? What are you remembered by? Enoch, for some particular reason, I have no idea what it looked like. Did he just disappear? Chariots of fire come and take him? Just transport it? I, I, I have no idea how, if I were there to take a snapshot of it, I have no idea what that would look like. But the word of God says with utter clarity, no, he was here, he was taken. He walked with God. There was a high level of intimacy with this man, with God. And so Enoch kind of stands out as a reminder in the midst of he died, he died, he died, he died, he didn't die. Well, then take a step back and go, now wait a minute, though. What about those who died? Well, they stepped into eternity as well. See, it feels so earthbound, but then Enoch kind of smacks you across the face and goes, well, hold on, you forgot about eternity. You forgot about eternity, that, that when your body shuts down, your soul leaves, it goes somewhere. And God, in his grace, allowed Enoch to not see death, but God took him. And I've got a ton of different questions. So did his body stay? When his soul was taken, did his body drop? I, I don't know the answer to these questions. <laughs> Dennis Chris knows most of the answers to these questions. <laughs> Apparently he hasn't lost his mind, he said. I found it funny he had to tell us that. <laughs> uh, anyway, so Enoch stands as a bright, shiny example of one who walked with the Lord, lived a life with him. And beloved, when he was translated from life into eternal life, he didn't skip a beat. Because his physical life, his earthly life, while he lived here, was walking in intimacy with God. He loved the Lord. He served the Lord. We're told that he, ple he was commended as one who pleased God. So he's a man of faith, because apart from faith, it's impossible to please God. And it's then he's taken up. I realize that death in the Bible is referred to as an enemy. I realize that death is harsh. It is a 
It's a very, very difficult moment when, you're, when somebody dies. But for you, for me, for those who are Christians, those who are born again in Jesus Christ, those who know him, we're going from life to greater life. Enoch went from life to even greater life <clears throat> immediately before the sovereign God as one who had pleased him. And so he is a powerful reminder of eternity. All right, back to Genesis chapter 5. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 5. So Enoch is the father of Methuselah. By the way, in your lifespan, if anybody has ever said, get out of the way, Methuselah, um, now you know why, what the joke is, if you didn't know at that time. He's the, uh, apparently the oldest person who ever lived. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. When Lamech lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah. Guys, there's, a, there's an important piece of theology here that I think we could miss if we didn't just stop for a second and recognize it. And here it is. God sovereignly chooses who he will use and how he will use them. Because here's the trick. We want to say, wow, so Noah must have been something better than the others. Not necessarily. Enoch must have been even better than the rest. Not necessarily. God sovereignly does what he does with the life of his people, how he sees fit. If he grants you the ability to be one that leads many to Christ and he uses you in a profound way, praise God, his sovereign will to use you in that way. If he uses you to draw one to the Lord Jesus Christ, then he used you sovereignly in his way. When I look at a genealogy, I am reminded, as I think about all the attachments to each one of these individuals, there's nothing about them that makes them great or grand or glorious. God specifically says to Israel, I didn't choose you because you were great or grand or glorious. You're the smallest. You're the weakest. I want to show my power in you. Now, the reason I speak to this is at times in, in the Bible, we can read it and we can find our Bible heroes. Beloved, the Bible hero is Jesus Christ. The weak, wimpy, useless, wretched sinners are the ones he utilizes. That'd be you and me, that'd be David, that'd be Saul, that'd be Solomon, that would be all these people. And so when this lands, we go, well, I don't know anything about Lamech, I don't know anything about these people, and then it lands on Noah and it says, but Noah, I think we do a great disservice to God and a great disservice to Noah when we say God chose to use Noah because Noah was better than the rest. No, it was his sovereign will to use Noah for his good purpose. And here's why his father named him Noah. He says, out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 500-year-old father. Happy Father's Day, Noah. <clears throat> so we see basically, guys, very simply, Methuselah to Noah and to the sons of Noah. What we're seeing here is the timeline God is giving us, moving us towards this huge transformation in history, namely the flood, uh, which is where we're going to pick up. Let me, let me finish with just a few takeaways. from the, the And the reason I, I word it this way, takeaways from meditation on a genealogy. I challenge you. I challenge you. Meditate on a genealogy. Meditate on the genealogy of Jesus. 
Uh, it's just so interesting. If you give it the time and you say, I'm curious to see who are these people, what do I know from the rest of the Word of God about these people that make up this genealogy? So here's four. And there's, there, I'm sure there's more, but here's four takeaways that I got from meditation on a genealogy. God is always faithful to his promise. Always. Always, 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 always. I cannot tell you how many promises I have broken. I can tell you God has never once broken a promise, never will break a promise. Genesis chapter 3.15, you go, wow. How is he going to keep that promise to get all the way to Jesus by the seed of the woman? Well, you're watching it before your very eyes. As you look at that genealogy, it shows you, man, man he's still carrying his word. He's still carrying his promise. He's still going to accomplish exactly what he wanted. So when Jesus Christ is on the cross, crucified, being spit on, murdered, and slandered, he is perfectly satisfying the promise made to Adam and Eve in the garden. The seed of the, of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Beloved, think of the years and the lives represented between the, the two pieces of history there. Between Adam and Eve and the Lord Jesus Christ. And you go, you mean he kept his promise that whole time? Not only did he keep it, guys, but he's, he's working in the people to accomplish that great and glorious purpose. Secondly, life on this earth, though at times feels like it's screeching by, is a mist, is brief. It's interesting. Some days feel like years and some years feel like days. Where there is a, a really high tense moment in your life and the clock broke. And you're like, I, I, this is never going to end. This is never going to end. This is why the psalmist says, how long, O oh Lord? And yet, there's those days where you sit down and you look behind you and you go, wow, Megan's going to be 14 years old. <laughs> or my brother, my oldest brother, I think just turned um, 43 years old. My dad, um, well, he, he don't want me to share that. Um, <laughs> He, he's old. And, <laughs> and as you... As you <laughs> it's all relative, okay? It's all relative. <laughs> it's amazing how you just look behind you and it went away. You think, man, how, how often do you hear people say or have you said, where'd the time go? Where'd the time go? Yes. Well, beloved, did you hear how long these people lived and how long have they been dead? Life on earth is very brief. And the thing is, I'm talking in the context of actually living most of your life. I have sat with families after the death of a baby. And it changes your perspective in reference to life. Because we say life is short. Well, for some, it's unbelievably short. Thirdly, what is done in this life matters for eternity. Did you notice the recommendation that all throughout church history, as the word of God has been written and put in the hands of followers of the Lord, they have read that Enoch was a man that pleased God. But for all eternity, he is in paradise with Almighty God, who he has been pleasing. <coughs> And as I stated earlier, very soon, everyone in this room will be in heaven or hell. You will be in either heaven or hell. You die, and we say, I believe they're in heaven. Because they made a profession, they knew the Lord Jesus Christ, they followed him. But the fact remains, everybody is on their way to one of two places. Very, very soon. And none of us know how soon. What is done in this life matters for eternity. And number four, finally, beloved, God has a purpose in everything. God has a purpose in everything. The word coincidence is a word I don't use very often because I don't believe in it. I don't believe in coincidences. I believe in a sovereign God who is working all things together for good for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Beloved, God has a purpose in it all. I challenge you in your reading of the Bible, look for details that at first glance, almost seemed like, why did they spend ink on that? 
I want you to be reminded because every detail is an instrument in the hand of God to accomplish something good in your life. May hurt, may be painful, may be a terrible day, but it's for your good ultimate. So, before I pray, <clears throat> there is no throwaway portions of the Word of God. I know you know that. All of it is inspired and profitable. We're Bible people. Pacific Coast Bible Church. It's an odd thing that there are many Christians who will fight hard over the doctrine of inspiration of Scripture. But then very few who give themselves to the reading of the whole book. Not necessarily read in one year or one month, but simply availing ourselves to the whole of God's Word. He has carefully sought for his word to be preserved throughout the years, and here we are, spoiled rotten with many copies of the Bible in our own homes, in our own language. And may, by God's grace, we not take his word for granted. I simply ask you, look at the gold gilding of your pages and see where it's rubbed off and see where it looks brand new. All of God's word is precious, and he has so much to say to us in the whole of his word. Father, thank you for Genesis chapter 5. God, a chapter that I know I have not spent a lot of time in over the years. And yet, Lord, your word has deeply touched my heart this week. Father, I pray for your blessing on PCBC. I ask, God, that we would be people who go hard after the text, who profoundly, Lord, deeply, we want to know what the Word of God says. And, Lord, may the Word of man fade, and let the Word of God stand strong. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Please stand and join with us in singing our closing hymn, Blessed Assurance.
I thank you for truths in your word that are, that are there, Lord. I thank you that you are sovereign, that you have a plan for our lives, you have a plan for your word and what is included. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that as we leave this building, Lord, that we will, we will walk with you. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.